So I'm really happy to invite the first speaker, Laura Randall from the University of Liverpool. Um, she will give a talk about the characterization of a precision cut tumor slice model to explore cholangiocarcinoma. And I remember two years ago she came here and uh, she shared with us the plan of what she wanted to do. And uh, now we are very happy and curious to hear the results. So just whilst they're setting up the slides, as I said, thank you very, very much for inviting me along today. So um, what I'd like to tell you about when we get the slides up and running is the ongoing work we're doing in utilising precision cut tumour slices in our lab in Liverpool. So I'll take you through some of the, the viability assessments that we've been conducting. We've now been characterising our model through proteomic analysis and some initial dosing studies as well. Aha. OK, so let's move on. I don't need to tell this audience that uh, cholangiocarcinoma is an aggressive bilia tract cancer or it's on an increased incidence globally, but in the UK particularly, or that it's actually, a, you know, remains a cancer of unmet need. So we'll move on. But we do know it's a highly mutagenic uh, cancer. And um, certainly we've seen this recently in the, the study that we have recently published. And we know that 50% of patients, you know, can have potentially target, targetable mutations. And we've heard a lot over the conference about FTFR, FGFR fusions, for example, uh, and, and other mutations. And what's becoming increasingly uh, evident is the importance of the immune system. Our data alone um, has shown both uh, the innate and the adaptive immune systems are playing a role now. Uh, and certainly the, the recent TOPAS trial. But what is evident is that actually to be able to move this work for forward to investigate some of these targets, we need better preclinical models, both to aid drug discovery uh, and to better understand uh, res response and resistance to be able to rationalise some of these potential targets. So what we need in a preclinical model is to effectively recapitulate that tumour biology. And when we've heard lots about the mouse models that are currently available, they could be infestation, uh, carcinogen induced or genetically modified. But we know that these mouse models are both timely, cost consuming, and obviously they raise ethical concerns. And it was back in 2020 in the consensus statement, which states that, you know, we need improved experimental models on the background of chronic liver damage to better, de to better understand the disease origin and the progression. And more recently, there has been now some preclinical, some criteria for preclinical models. And in this paper, um, they compare the benefits and limitations of all of these models. For example, 2D cells, 2D cell culture, um, relatively cheap, easy to grow in the lab, but you know, it's a single, single cell line. How um, relevant are they to the actual clinical situation? Or as we've heard about today, the genetic um, genetically engineered mouse models where we can look at different targeted mutations and see how they initiate uh, you know, cancer progression and initiation. But again, these are timely um, and, and costly. And from this paper, they came out with a list of recommendations, which um, you can see here and you can read in the paper. But to paraphrase, they say that in in vivo, in, in, uh, an in vivo model should show um, positivity for cytokeratin 7 or 19. You should be able to classify the cholangiocarcinoma by specific subtype. We should retain morphological features and we should be able to recapitulate the phenotype of the source tissue. So in Liverpool, we have taken the precision cut tissue slice model and to date we've now had 18 specimens of which 14 have been confirmed as being cholangiocarcinoma and we've got seven intrahepatic and seven perihyla. But the beauty of this model is that we can use tissue from any organ, um, it can be rodent, it can be human and we can culture them ex vivo. And there's been a number of different improvements in the, the technique, um, in the media to enable us to use this now as a preclinical model going forward. So the benefits for us is we can use human tissue to model human disease and therefore we get that um, population heterogeneity too. We have all the um, cells present in the correct orientation, the tissue architecture is, is maintained, we've got the tumour micro, um, the, the 
the tumor microenvironment if we're using tumor cells. So we can use healthy and diseased tissue. And certainly um, when the surgeons collect the specimens, we can get um, t both of those tissues from the patient. But for us, we think this is going to bridge that translational gap from the lab to the clinic. And at the time of we started this work, Ray Young's group um, over at the University of Washington had published a protocol where they had been uh, utilizing this technique predominantly for colorectal liver mets. And they made some modifications to the media. Uh, and there were some quite significant changes to uh, the current de Graaff protocol everyone else was using. So we've, we've started with, with this as our sort of starting point, really. <clears throat> So where did we begin? Well, we initiated a specimen collection network, which sounds quite fancy, but it's literally a WhatsApp group um, between the clinicians and the researchers in the lab. And obviously we collect um, spe uh, specimens um, from patients that have consented. Um, and here you can see a perihyla tumor. And Tim, um, the surgical fellow, will collect um, a section of this tumor, ensuring that he doesn't um, alter the resection margin into organ preservation buffer. And since the, the um, surgeons have moved hospitals, I can now get this into the laboratory and process within 30 minutes. So here you can see a section of our tumor in the organ preservation buffer there in, in, in A, and we begin by cutting cores. So if you imagine something a bit like a metal straw, we produce cores of tissue that are about the size of a pencil. Or the, the diameter of a pencil. So here you can see a section's taken out and we put this into our tissue holder essentially to keep it, um, to, to aid the cutting because obviously we're trying to cut very thin sections. If we have more irregular shaped specimens or much smaller specimens, we need to embed them in agros to hold them firm in the cutting platform. And we've also been utilizing this technique recently on core tissue biopsies. So we've been doing some work up um, on this. Obviously, these are much smaller in diameter, so you've got um, much, much less tissue, m uh, far fewer cells, uh, but we are able to cut, um, we are able to cut slices from um, tumor biopsies. Okay. So some of you will have seen this before. This is our tissue slicer. And here we have our specimens in, in this holder here. And this reciprocating arm moves the slice, the, the tissue backwards and forwards over um, a blade. And this machine is currently set up with blue um, agros plugs, which enable us to set the thickness. And we collect our slices as it cuts into the glass trap here um, into krebs heinzler buffer. So we cut cores of five millimeters. Uh, there are different sizes you can put in the machine, 250 microns thick. And importantly, we can cut many different slices um, from each core. Oh, there we go. Oh, no, there we go. So when we initially began, we started, um, we had a number of different parameters we needed to consider. First of all, what format were we going to do? Were we going to do it in high oxygen or low oxygen? Uh, were we going to... Um, put them on inserts or put them in a shaking platform. Um, and we, we turned to mathematical modeling to, to help us do this, actually. And we published this work uh, earlier in the year. Uh, and the take home message here is we found to better model physiological oxygen concentrations, because ultimately we need to ensure our slices are alive. And this has all been done using normal liver as our, our model we needed to have a five millimeter core diameter so that we could um, model the oxygen levels that were entering the liver. It is partially deoxygenated, so 65 millimeters um, entering and, and 35 millimeters leaving. And this graph here just shows the position in the well. And the take home message was we got much greater um, tolerance to where that slice could be if we used the smaller diameter. And you can read about it in our paper. Okay. So we've got some slices, how viable are they? So as a bit of a rough ready assay to begin with, uh, we utilize an MTS. We started with ATP, but it was destructive and these are very precious samples and we have very little tissue. Um, so we moved over to this methodology and essentially if the cells are viable, it goes from being yellow to a purple color. 
and we can utilize it now to help us with this as a, almost as a screening tool we know we get heterogeneity across our tumour, therefore there are some slices that are predominantly stroma and we don't want to take, take those forward into our analysis. So we use it now um, to essentially screen which slices we put into culture. But what you can see here is, and this is just the raw MTS data, is that over time in culture, there isn't really a, um, there isn't a reduction in MTS value. So we are keeping our slices viable via this methodology and here down at the bottom we have it relative to the day zero control and we can also show this is an n of two um, mts results for our biopsy data as well so they are still viable after a period of time in culture so one of the questions we asked our, last year actually at this this um, conference was how does this relate to the tumor cells okay so we looked at tumor cellular cellularity and how it uh, correlates with viability. So we're utilizing here CK19 as our marker of uh, tumor cells. And in, cell, in, in wells where we got low MTS values, we noticed there was much higher stromal value when we looked on histology. So um, low MTS, generally a high uh, stromal ratio and very few um, tumor cells. And the opposite, so in in slices where we have obviously far more uh, tumor cells, much higher CK19 positive staining, we have much um, higher MTS values and, and much better viability. We've also been looking now at, uh, and I'll show you the data now from Cleve Caspase 3, but we also have similar for KI67. We're trying to use this now as our marker of histology and uh, of viability. So um, cleave caspase is a marker of apoptosis. So obviously, if our cells are viable, we're not going to have many, many cells that are stained with cleave caspase 3. Uh, and the diagram on the right there, if it's brown, that's where we get positive staining for apoptosis. And we're now utilizing QPAS, and we're training the system now to identify our uh, stromal cells, our tumor cells, and our immune cells. And we can now correlate the staining, uh, the cleave caspase staining um, to, uh, to which cell type, essentially. And we can now um, start to quantify that. This is only an, an N of two or three, I believe. Um, but we can now look at the entire um, population of cells and, and the percentage of cells that are, uh, that are stained with cleave caspase. Um, other histology profiling that we've done um, over time in culture, obviously H and E staining. So we're, we're showing that we are able to maintain that architecture. Uh, CK19 staining, so we're retaining that positivity, we're retaining the tumour um, phenotype. And we've now done some pan um, lymphocyte and macrophage staining. So we do get um, immune cells in our slices. Um, and um, Owen, who's our new PhD student, will be characterising those um, immune populations and their activation status um, over his PhD over the next three years. Changing tech now, we've been characterizing our model using proteomic analysis. So within our laboratory, whenever we um, implement a new model, we need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of that. And in our experience, um, RNA doesn't always translate to what's happening at the protein levels, and we have expertise in proteomics. So we wanted to initially characterize um, our samples, get a better understanding of the proteomic profile for cholangiocarcinoma. Um, does our slice remain um, representative of the tumour in, in culture? And what is the impact of that, um, that timing culture actually on that proteome? And this is work that Tim has been conducting recently and he's been very diligently optimising the extraction process. So if you think a tissue slice, I, would, I liken it to when you're using a hole punch and that little white disc of paper, they're about that size. And he's now able to recover two and a half thousand proteins from that disc of tissue. Um, so we've now generated a, a reference library and we're using Swath proteomics, so um, um, independent acquisition data, independent acquisition. So we're scanning the entire mass to charge ratio range. It's not just the most abundant proteins, but for us, it means we can go back and add data in at a later date. So we cut our slices and that's our day zero. And then we've also looked at slices that have been in culture now for three, seven, and 15 days. And we literally got this data a couple of days ago. So this is a very rough and ready approach. 
But what we can quite clearly see in culture is that we are maintaining our tumor phenotypes. We are, they, they are separating according to intrahepatic or perihilar um, tumor types. And we have six specimens in total, um, and we have technical replicates of these. And here we've got a volcano plot. So essentially, you want a quite narrow volcano plot. We've got a full change across the x-axis here, so changes in the proteome up and down, and then we've got significance on the y-axis. And each of these dots relates to a protein. And then we've done some very initial uh, ingenuity pathway analysis. And if it's gray, it's unchanged. If it is blue, it's gone down. And if it's orange, it's gone up. Uh, and this is showing some differences between now the ICCA and the PCCA that we need to interrogate further with our bio, um, bioinformatics colleagues. But importantly, we wanted to see how these tumours um, were maintained in culture. So we have three ICCA patients here at day zero in blue. Um, the red is day three. Day seven is yellow and uh, green is uh, day 15. And the take home message here is that we get the most of the changes in the proteome occur, occur in those first three days. And that's not, uh, that has been see, seen in the literature. People believe there's a, an adaptive response, almost a wound healing around the outside of the slices. And again, here we've got a, a mix, mixed bag of proteins that are going up and down in our uh, pathway analysis. And you can't see it very clearly, but I think the cell, cell signaling was one of those pathways. Uh, but as you can see, by day 15, everything's sort of stabilized here. And we get a similar picture with our perihyla. However, there are predominantly uh, um, down regulation of our proteins or down expression of our proteins up to day three. Okay, uh, changing tack tightly again now. Ooh. We have also begun some bioenergetic analysis. So we have another PhD student that is now um, conducting mitochondrial stress tests. Um, we know that glucose metabolism can impact immune cell fate and function. Um, and we know, to, we know that bioenergetics or dysregulation of bioenergetics is a hallmark of cancer. So he's been conducting work on how Utilising different inhibitors of the electron transport chain can give us information about basal respiration levels, um, ATP production, um, my, uh, maximal respiration in the cell. So we've been adapting our slices to fit into the seahorse platform, which is much smaller, and hence why we were looking at biopsy tissue, actually. And he's been doing some very initial studies now using normal liver slices. Um, again, so um, the biopsy tissues around um, 1.8 millimeters in diameter. And he's been doing um, dose response studies with these different inhibitors so that we can get the largest dynamic range possible. So that is ongoing work within the laboratory. And we've also done now, this is a, an NF2, NF3, I believe. Um, so we're starting to look at the response to drugs in our slices. Um, we have used um, active metabolite of Cape Cytobine, DFUR, as a dose response. Um, we've also combined cisgem in the plate, gemcitabine, and um, ultimately we want to be able to get to the point that we can do a trial in a dish. So on day zero, we cut our slices, then we leave them overnight, and then we dose uh, the slices day one, day two, day three, and we perform an MTS and histology on, on, uh, after that. And importantly here, we do it all within the same slice. We know we get heterogeneity. We know we've got patient differences too. So we need to know what that response is in that individual slice. And that's and we are starting to and now see some, some reduction um, in response to some drugs, but that's ongoing work too. So uh, to summarize, we are able to generate slices now from um, mass forming perihyla tissue and our intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinomas. We can keep them alive in culture for 15 days. We could probably go longer, but we've never tried. They are retaining um, histological features of the source tumor. And we've done some initial responses to chemotherapeutic drugs and the ongoing um, characterization of the model. So 
<clears throat> Moving forward, we've got a lot more work planned with the immune cell population with two, cell, two students uh, coming on board over the summer as they're initially characterizing the activation status and the presence of the cells and how they re are retained in culture uh, and then how we can start to manipulate those to potentially make them more responsive to immunotherapy. Uh, we'll continue with the seahorse analysis and we've also got some very, very initial work now where we're actually putting our slices onto some biological membranes to see whether they can uh, start to proliferate in culture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.